Hello and welcome to today's episode of Discovery at Home. My name is Jillian and I'm a science educator at the Discovery Center. I'm so excited to be streaming to you live today so you can continue to learn new things with science, interact with us at the Discovery Center, and most importantly, have fun. Today's workshop, Diversity of Life, is about classifying different animals and plants that live here in Nova Scotia. We will classify some arthropods together and then you will use your very own classification system to group different animals and plants in your area. While we're waiting for others to join the stream, let's get brainstorming about the many different living things we have seen around us today. Or since it's still early in the day, you can include yesterday as well. How many different living things can you see right now? Do you see people, pets, houseplants, insects or birds outside your window? There are many different living creatures all around us. Let me tell you a story about a day in my backyard to see if you can count how many different living things I saw that day. Once upon a time, a few sunny weekends ago, I was out in the garden planting lily plants when I dug up a June bug that was burrowed deep into the soil. The worst part was at that point, I was digging with my hands ready to place my lily and the little hooks on the June bug's legs gripped onto my garden gloves. Now, I don't know about you, but June bugs kind of freak me out a little bit, so I scraped it off my glove and gave it a fling with my garden trowel. The funny part was that my June bug fling sent off a chain reaction of living things around me. Just after flinging the bug, I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye from the direction I sent the June bug flying. It turns out that nearby, there was a chipmunk munching on some seeds the chickadees had dropped into the grass below. That June bug startled the chickadee and sent it flying at breakneck speed up the trunk of a nearby maple tree. When it went up the tree, I heard this chirp and saw a beautiful red cardinal fly out of the same tree and land on my bird feeder. The part that amazes me most about this story is that as soon as that cardinal landed on top of the feeder, I saw an unexpected critter run out of the bird feeder. Can you guess what it might have been? I would think most people would expect it to be another bird in the feeder, but notice that I said it ran, and birds usually won't run when they can just fly away. This animal was small, furry, and had a tail. Any idea what it is now? My mystery critter was a small field mouse that was looking for a quick and easy snack. While watching the mouse run under my deck, I heard a weird chirping sound coming from my house, and I turned to see my cat sitting in the open window, eyes the size of saucers looking very excited about the mouse. The mouse had learned to climb up, climb up the pole to my bird feeder, and I still notice it from time to time thanks to my very observant and very vocal indoor cat. All right, friends, were you able to count how many different living things I mentioned? I'm interested to know what your numbers are because perhaps you've already started classifying these living things without realizing it. In my story, I mentioned seeds, a plant that flowers, the lily, and one that doesn't, the grass. I had a creepy interaction with an insect, the June bug, and mentioned six different animals, two different birds, a chipmunk, a mouse, a cat, and a human, me of course, for a total of 10 living things. Now I asked you to count how many different living things, and for me, I counted the plants and birds as separate individuals because they're different species. But maybe some of you out there classified my animals without even realizing it. Did any of you count the plants as one type of living thing, and also count the birds as a single type of living thing, giving you a smaller number than I had? This wouldn't necessarily be wrong. We are just using different classification criteria. There are many different characteristics we could use to classify these living things. And we'll get some help with this from our science educator, Natalie, or sorry, Emily, very soon. But first, let me welcome anyone that has joined our stream after the beginning. Thanks so much for joining and welcome to our Diversity of Life workshop. My name is Jillian and I'm a science educator at the Discovery Center. Today's workshop is all about classifying plants and animals here in Nova Scotia. Make sure you tune back in after you've classified your different plants and animals so we can look at just how diverse our province is. Now I'll ha hand it over to Emily to help you decide how you would like to classify the life around you, starting with arthropods. Get ready for some interesting critters all the way from beetles to lobsters. 
Now let's crawl on over to Emily. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Diversity of Life Workshop. I'm Emily, and I'm really excited to be here today because we are going to look at every species on Earth. No, I'm just kidding. We definitely don't have time to talk about every single species on Earth today, but we are going to see if we can classify some different species that you might find around Nova Scotia, including the Discovery Center's very own Claudia the Lobster. But before we start to classify, why do scientists want to classify living things? Well, let's try something. I want you to close your eyes and start to think about every living thing you've ever seen, from plants or pets that you might have at home, to things you've come across on a walk or a hike outside, to things you may have seen on a trip outside of Nova Scotia, to every bug that's ever bitten you and beyond. All right, open your eyes. Now, I'll bet that you started to lose track pretty quick of how many living things you've ever seen in your life. And on top of the living things that you've seen are the living things that you haven't seen. Now, these might be organisms that used to be alive but are not anymore, like the dinosaurs, organisms that live at the very bottom of the ocean or hidden away in one very specific part of the rainforest in Brazil, or they might just be too small to see with your eyes. These might be things like microorganisms or bacteria that live in your gut or in the soil and even in lakes or in the ocean. So even though you may find it easy to tell if something is alive, all it takes is a quick walk through the woods or a little dip in the ocean to come across so many species that you begin to lose count. And this makes it really hard for scientists to say for certain how many species there are on Earth. So how do they even do it? Well, scientists can use math combined with the number of known species on Earth. So that's all the species that we've seen and added to a list. And they can use that to estimate Earth's total biodiversity, which is the total variety of species on Earth. But how many species do you think there are? 50? 1 million? 10 million? Let me narrow it down for you. Scientists estimate that there are anywhere between 5.3 million species and 1 trillion species on Earth, with the most likely estimates somewhere around 8.7 million species in total, and humans are only one. Now, with millions and millions of species on Earth, how can we keep track? Well, we can use taxonomy, which is the science of naming, defining, and classifying organisms. And this helps us monitor Earth's biodiversity. Taxonomy plays an important role in recording how many species there are on Earth, knowing which species are most closely related to each other, and even which species existed first. We can classify organisms by identifying important attributes or traits. Now, these are physical features that we can see and make observations about, like feathers on birds, or behavioral characteristics that we can observe over time. And these might be something like bird mating dances. If you've ever seen birds doing funny mating dances in the woods, that's something we can watch. And then we can use these attributes to help us select criteria for how we want to group the different organisms. There are many ways you can classify living things, and scientists use several different charts to help them. Let's make some observations about a starflower, which is a plant, a swordfish, which is a fish, an alligator, a reptile, a grasshopper, an insect, and a cardinal, which is a bird. So we can classify them using two of the charts that scientists would use. One chart is called a phylogenetic tree. And in this chart, we use different attributes, like whether our specimen can make its own food, if it has legs or wings, and if it has feathers. And we can use those attributes to tell the different species apart in our set. Scientists use these phylogenetic trees to figure out where organisms share common ancestors, which helps them find out which species are most closely related to each other. And that's a lot like how we use our own family trees to figure out how we're related to our family members. Here you can see that each attribute in the green boxes is present in all of the organisms that come after it. So our grasshopper can't make its own food, it has legs, and it has wings, but it doesn't have feathers like the cardinal does. We can also classify these organisms using what's called a dichotomous key. And this is where we ask different questions to help us identify which group an organism belongs in. So instead of marking all the attributes along a tree, we are using this key as a guide to help us sort our specimens by making a choice at each step along the way. So we're asking questions at each step to determine what features the specimen has. 
starting with, does it make its own food? And the only organism on this chart that makes its own food is the star flower because plants are producers. So they use water and energy from the sun to make their own food. Whereas animals have to consume plants or other animals in order to get their energy. Now, both charts get us wondering, what do these organisms have in common? What is different about them? Can you think of any other examples that we could add into our charts? Are there other animals that have legs, wings, and feathers? Well, there are definitely other birds out there. So how could you tell a cardinal, which is a red and black bird, apart from other birds that share those same attributes? Would you have used different attributes to sort these organisms in your own chart? Well, these attributes we used are only a few that are helpful for classifying. How else can we classify animals? Well, we can divide all animals into two groupings based on one major characteristic. Vertebrates, animals that have a backbone, and invertebrates, animals that do not have a backbone. Do you know which grouping you're in? Well, humans have a skeleton inside our bodies that is very strong and has a backbone, so we are vertebrates. Our skeleton is made of bone, and it grows as we grow so that it can help support our muscles and protect our organs inside of us. And when we look at it outside of the body, <laughs> it doesn't quite look like we do. But it gives our bodies the shape that is familiar to what we would see in a whole person. Some animals, like cnidarians, which is a group that includes jellyfish, sea anemones, or corals, have what's called a hydrostatic skeleton, which means that they use a fluid under pressure to give their body structure and help them move. Other groupings of animals, like arthropods, which is a grouping that includes lobsters, crabs, and insects, have no backbone at all. Instead, arthropods have an external skeleton, or exoskeleton, which is often called its shell, that they molt or shed when they outgrow it. Now this process is why the molt of Claudia the Discovery Center lobster looks just like a live lobster, but is not alive. There's no lobster inside of the shell, but Claudia is just fine. She's in a much bigger shell, much happier downstairs. But how do you think that the exoskeleton might perform a different function than our own skeleton? Well, one thing is for sure, my skeleton doesn't look like armor that I would wear outside my body. So maybe we can say that Claudia's exoskeleton protects her from the outside environment just like armor would. Arthropods in general all share attributes like exoskeletons, jointed limbs, and segmented bodies. However, if we look at the mouth parts of different arthropods, we can begin to sort them into smaller, more specific groupings based on what they use their mouth parts for. So let's divide arthropods into four mouth part types. The first type are chewing mouth parts. These mouth parts look a little like pincers and they're good for holding food and pushing food into the mouth. The second type is piercing or sucking mouth parts. So these mouth parts have a long pointy piece that is good for poking into the skin and drawing blood from other animals. There are also siphoning mouth parts, and these have a long tube-like piece that's good for drawing up liquid, like in a straw. And the final type are sponging mouth parts. So these mouth parts have a round end that releases saliva to help break down food before it's mopped up by the organism. All right, so let's start with our crab. So these you'd see probably on a beach scurrying around. They usually walk sideways because their legs are jointed in a way that helps them move sideways easier. And if we're looking at the mouth parts, this is right about where they would be, but it's kind of hard to see. So I'm gonna flip our crab over so we can see him a little better. So now we can see the underside and you can see really well how segmented this crab's body is. And right in here is where the mouth parts are. Now it's a little hard to tell, but crabs do have chewing mouth parts. So either side of its mouth would come together and chew so it can break down food that it picks up. And it also uses its claws to help it eat. So this might be crunching up shells that it finds on the beach so it can get at the soft food inside, or it might be picking something up and bringing it to its mouth so it can eat it. But either way, they do chew their food. So we can say that crabs have chewing mouth parts. Now, what other parts of the crab really help them do that? Other than their claws, they are nice and low to the ground so they can scurry over top of their food and they can just press their mouth down towards the ground so that the food is right up against their mouth and they can eat it really easily. 
All right, so if we're looking at our next specimen, this is a spider. So spiders are pretty closely related to crabs and they also have chewing mouth parts. So if you can see, they have little appendages that come off of its mouth there. And I'll flip this guy over as well so we can see his mouth parts a little bit better. But just like the crab on the underside, we have two parts that would come together and chew up the food for the spider and it can force the food into its mouth. Now spiders can't chew the same way that insects can chew because their mouth parts are a little bit different. They're similar shape, but they are hollow. And the hollow part in some species like tarantulas can contain venom that helps them disable their prey and then push their prey into their mouth and crush it up in a way that's a little bit different than the insects would. All right, so here we have our scorpion. So you probably have seen pictures of scorpions, but you might not have seen one in real life because we don't actually have them in Nova Scotia. But they have a similar thing to crabs where they have uh, pincers as their front appendages. So this can again help them capture prey and bring it to their mouth. And they also have, if you look closely, different little hairs along their body. And these are sensory hairs that help them detect where their prey might be. And if you look closely at their mouth, you can kind of see that there are two separate parts there. And those actually open up and crunch, just like the crab would chew, just like the spider would chew. So they have similar mouth parts. And of course, they have their tail at the back. So this has a little spike that is their uh, stinger. And their tail is actually called a metasoma. And this is used to strike their prey and immobilize their prey with venom. So our scorpion has a lot of adaptations that help it be great at hunting prey. So this specimen, you may be familiar with ants. Uh, this specimen is our first insect that we're looking at. So although all of the specimens we're looking at are arthropods, this is the first one that's actually an insect. And you can tell because it has six legs two antenna, and then three segments of its body. And this part here is its front end, so it's got a big head, and you can see that it's got two big protruding parts right there, and those are its mouth parts. So these are really good for crushing up plants or other animals that it's trying to eat or trying to carry, and ants are really, really strong, so these are very tough mouth parts and they can break a lot of things up and grind down their food so that they can take it home to their colony. And these pincers on some ants, depending on what they do in the colony, can be really big and act like horns so that they can defend themselves and they can defend their families. All right, so this here is a beetle. And once again, we have an insect. And you can tell, again, because it's got six legs, two antenna, and three segments of its body. Its head segment is a little bit smaller than the ant's was, but it has really big horn-like things at the front of its face. And these are actually part of its mouth parts. So these help it defend itself, fight for its territory, and then also underneath the beetle, we can see right in there are where the mouth parts would be. So these are part of the mouth parts, but once it gets down into this area, it can crush up the food and chew the food. So again, it has chewing mouth parts. So this wasp is our last insect, our last arthropod that we are looking at. And again, you can tell it's an insect because it has those six legs, two antenna, and three segments of its body. And you can also see the wings on this wasp. Now you couldn't see the wings on the beetle, but the beetle did have wings just underneath its exoskeleton. So it has a portion that would lift up and let its wings out. But the wasp just has its wings out and ready to go because it does a lot of flying around. Now if I flip our wasp over, we can get a look at its underside and on its head right about here would be where its mouth parts are. And wasps, I don't know if you've ever seen them outside chewing things up, but they have pretty obvious mouth parts where they're chewing. So these parts come apart and you can see inside its mouth and it'll crush up the plants that it's eating, it'll crush up the other bugs that it's eating, and it can carry things around in its mouth pretty well. So as it turns out, all of our specimens that we looked at are in the same grouping. They all have the same mouth parts. Does that surprise you? They all have the chewing mouth parts, but can you think of how they would use them differently? 
Predators like the spider and the scorpion have venom to paralyze their prey, while the smaller specimens, like the ant, sometimes use their mouth parts to defend themselves. So the function of the mouth parts varies depending on how they're shaped and depending on what happens in the organism's day-to-day -day life. None of these arthropods had piercing or sucking mouth parts, but can you think of something that would? Maybe that really annoying thing that buzzes around your head all night on a camping trip? A mosquito. These little insects can insert their piercing part directly in our skin and suck up blood to feed on, which essentially means that they are vampires. <laughs> and what about siphoning mouth parts? What might use these mouth parts that are straw-like? A butterfly. Now, butterflies have adapted to be able to drink nectar straight out of a flower. And some birds, like a hummingbird, also have a similar thing that they do, but they do it with their beak and a tongue. So butterflies can actually suck up the nectar directly into their mouth using their mouth parts. And as for sponging mouth parts, the most likely place you'll find these is on different flies. Have you ever seen a housefly circling around food that's been left on the counter? If you watch them closely, you can see them dabbing their mouth all along the bits of food, and this helps them break down the food particles so that they can mop up the soggy mess and eat it. Not the most appetizing way to enjoy a meal, but whatever works. Okay, my friends, I have just one more thing that I want to learn. How diverse is the life in Nova Scotia? Now it's up to you to see how many specimens you can classify around you to help me answer that question. Identify the most important attributes of different specimens around you to develop your own classification system. This can be in the form of a phylogenetic tree or dichotomous key that we talked about earlier, or it can be in any form that you find most helpful for organizing your specimens. So be as creative as you want and pick the attributes that make the most sense to you. What do you think is the most important thing when you're classifying different organisms? Now, as you're classifying, keep asking yourself, how can I determine where a specimen belongs in my chart? When we first started classifying living things a long time ago, Western scientists made observations that helped them make decisions about how living things should be classified. But over time, other evidence like DNA and fossils have helped to either support or refute earlier decisions on how organisms should be classified. So think about how you, as a scientist, will justify your choices for your groupings and what other evidence you could use to help modify your classification system. See how many plants and animals you can include in your chart and share your classification chart with others, like us here at the Discovery Center. Make sure you're not disturbing your specimens that you're classifying, though. Make good observations by watching closely or drawing pictures or taking photographs, but don't remove anything from its own environment. As well, recall that Mi'kmaq ways of knowing would tell us that even earth and rocks have spirit and are deeply connected to all living things. So it's up to you to decide if you will include non-living things in your chart. Have fun with your classifying. I can't wait to see all the species that we can find. Now it's your turn. Have fun and try your best to classify as many living things as you can find using your own classification attributes. So you can take pictures of the different species you find, draw pictures of your favorites, or write them all down in your chart and share it with us. What you want to share is up to you. So if you only have one plant or animal nearby, that's okay. You can share how you know what type of plant or animal it is. Viewers at home, if you've tuned in late in the stream and missed the background science with Emily or my earlier introductions, you can rewind any time during the live stream. It's probably best to rewind now and watch Emily's video on classification before proceeding. You can also download a written learning guide from our Discovery at Home website to fill you in on all the details. We're almost ready to head off to observe the living things around us and start classifying. But I want to remind you about our ongoing Show Us Your Science contest. As you complete today's activity, please share your science with us on Flipgrid and social media, and don't forget to tag the Discovery Center. This will enter you into our draw for a science, uh, science at Home prize pack. Good luck. You can submit your science anytime before the end of our Discovery at Home series, but Remember, if you want your work featured on today's live show, please send in your classifications by 10.55 a.m. If you have questions, you can reach out on our Discovery at Home webpage, and myself and our team of educators will be online to help you out. 
We can't wait to see what you find. Tune back in at 11 a.m. so we can check out our classifications together and see the diversity of plants and animals you could find. See you again soon. Hello and welcome back to today's Discovery at Home episode, Diversity of Life. If you didn't tune in earlier, my name is Jillian and today we classified lots of different living things, including a lobster, a butterfly, and even a scorpion. If you are tuning in late and want to see what you've missed, you can rewind the video now to watch my intro and the how-to portion with Emily. You can also find the learning guide on our Discovery at Home webpage to help you classify different living things. Thanks to everyone who sent in their classifications. If you haven't already sent in your classifications, it's not too late to be entered in our Show Us Your Science contest. You can share a picture or video of your classification chart or the plants and animals you included. You can do so using Flipgrid or social media for a chance to win a Science at Home prize pack. Don't forget to tag the Discovery Center and best of luck. So since I'll be spending most of my day today with only one species of living things around, humans, I'm going to use all the living things you observe to make my own classification chart. I may also sneak a few of the things in from my story earlier. So let's see what you, our viewers, have sent in. Our first classification is from Riley and they actually have a question here and they sent in, this is gelato, she is a tarantula. Is she an insect? Let's have a look at the video, make some observations of the tarantula, and see what we can figure out. All right, so right away I notice that gelato looks pretty hairy or furry, and I see lots of legs there. Let's see if we can count body segments in our friend here. Looks like there might be just two. What do you think at home? Interesting, it looks like gelato is searching maybe for some food. So I right away notice the two body segments, the eight legs, and that hair on the body. So I have a good idea that this is probably not actually an insect. Viewers at home, do you know what gelato might be? I suspect gelato is still within that arthropod category like Emily mentioned, but because our friend has eight legs and two body segments instead of six legs and three body segments like an insect, it's actually not an insect at all. It's an arachnid. Just like the spiders that we can find in the world around us, this eight-legged critter is an insect. There are other things that can help us determine whether it's an insect or an arachnid as well. Things like the type of eyes it has. That's one way. I encourage you to keep looking up, keep doing some searching, see if you can find other differences that would set this critter apart from insects. It's up to you to see what else you can find to help support that answer. Let's check out our next classification. Alright, so this was sent in by Jen. Jen has sent in her furry little critter here, Murphy, and it looks like Murphy might be ready to have a snack of some carrots. Let's check it out. Let's make some observations about Murphy. So right away I notice that Murphy is hopping instead of crawling like our tarantula or walking slowly. Murphy also has a lot of fluffy fur or hair going on and has two very obvious floppy ears. So very different from our tarantula that we saw earlier. I do also notice that Murphy has, probably hiding behind some of that fluff, some little whiskers in there too. Different from our tarantula. Oh, Murphy was ready for a close-up today. How cute. Thanks for sending that in, Jen. Our next classification is not an animal or an arachnid, but looking at plants and classifying them by smell. What a unique way to classify some living things. Let's check out the video. So it looks like our viewer has lots of plants at home. Oh, this one looks familiar to me from the kitchen. Let's see. Hmm, that one I'm not so sure about. We'll have to see what they classify it as. That one looks to me like it might be a little succulent. I'm noticing a few similarities and differences. The first two remind me of something that might be edible in my kitchen, and the third one, maybe not so much.
This one looks pretty familiar as well. Aha, we've got a bonus in there. Nice twist. What could their bonus organism be? Looks pretty cloudy, it's living in water. Hmm, smells like bread. Interesting observation. So I think I have a good hint of what your mystery organism was. And I expect that it probably is yeast. It might have just looked like murky, muddy water, but remember we're classifying living things today and I know that a yeast is a fungus that's really good at helping create gases that get our bread nice and fluffy and rising. Great job with that observation. So now that we've checked out all the living things you found, I'm kind of thinking about what they have in common and I'm also thinking about what differences I might have seen to help classify them into groups. We can also look at how many individuals we end up with in each of our groups on our chart and that will help us figure out which group is most diverse. So now that I've made an attempt at making some observations, I've got a chart here to show you how I classified your organisms. So I started doing this over the break and at first I had just two categories and I had plants and I had animals. But depending on your criteria for classification, you might break that animal group up into something a little different. So I started with looking at my plants. I noticed that they all have green leaves. I know that plants all respond to the sun. And my examples that I think I recognize from your video there were sage, basil, and maybe oregano, because I noticed you said one smelled like pizza. For my animals, I first classified Murphy and Gelato, the tarantula, into the same group because I noticed the things they had in common were hairs, eyes, and legs. But I did a little bit of searching over the break and it turns out that tarantulas don't have fur like a rabbit, it's actually hair. So we could classify them based on that or we could classify them based on some other things. So I decided to make a second grouping, another alternate way to classify them and change it to my grouping being mammal and insect, or I should actually say arachnid in this case. So for mammals, I decided Murphy falls under that because he's a warm-blooded creature and, well, many other characteristics of mammals, one being that they don't lay eggs. On the other hand, my arachnid, Gelato, lays eggs and it also has two body segments and eight legs, not the two legs like, or not the four legs like Murphy or two legs like a human. So many different ways we can classify things. We could have more or fewer groups depending on what important attributes we picked for our classification scheme. Now that I've made an attempt at classifying all the living things we saw today, let me leave you with a few more classifications to, to explore after today's show. Where would you, a human, go in your chart? And what evidence or criteria do you have for this? What about a foreign species like a tiger, a hippo, or a penguin? How would they fit in? Do you need to change the important attributes you outlined in your chart to include these new specimens? If so, hopefully this helps you understand the challenges that early scientists faced when new species were discovered and that scientists continue to face today as they discover new forms of marine life in the deepest depths of our oceans. I want to thank those of you who are watching live today and those tuning in later for stopping by to learn all about the science of taxonomy with us. We learned how to classify organisms by identifying important attributes and traits and using those physical or behavioral attributes to narrow down criteria to help us group our organisms. I hope you keep observing the living things around you, spotting the similarities between them, and continue to marvel at just how unique every creature is. I'm Jillian from the Discovery Center, reminding you to keep observing life and stay curious.